to Alley Talks. I'm today's host, Andrew Olson. My pronouns are he and him. I am a lead front-end developer at Bounteous. Uh, I enjoy front-end development and the challenge of making the web accessible for everyone on any device. I'm thrilled to be a part of the Alley Talks team and hosting today's discussion. First off, I want to talk about some rules and reminders. Uh, I want to take a moment to remind people that our group seeks to provide a friendly and safe environment. We require all participants to adhere to the accessibility code of conduct. Uh, this applies to all community interactions and events. This also applies to verbal questions as well as chats in the text channels. The code of conduct can be found on our websites at alleytalks.com. All participants should be able to engage in productive dialogue and should be able to share and learn with each other in an atmosphere of mutual respect. If you have any questions for our speaker today, please post it on Twitter with the hashtag AlleyTalks. That's hashtag A11YTALKS. Or if you're participating in the live chat, add your question to the YouTube chat window. Let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker, Vaughn Eaton. Pronouns are he, him. He is the events and engagement manager at Drupal at the Drupal Association. Uh, fun fact about Vaughn is from high school to grad school, Vaughn was a barista. In another life, Vaughn would have made artisanal coffee his career. Maybe when Vaughn retires, it'll finally open up that queer local coffee shop. Uh, Vaughn, please say hello to everyone, and I'd love to know your favorite item you made when you were a barista. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm sipping on a vanilla oat milk latte this morning that I made, but when I was a barista, I think my favorite is just a blonde flat white with half whole milk, half brave, and just like a little bit of real maple syrup. That was like my favorite latte to make back in the day. That sounds delicious. It was uh, so good. Also, do you have any ideas for the name of your uh, coffee shop when, when you're ready to take the leap? Yeah, so uh, my partner and I would want to do it together. And so, you know, we've like, we've definitely workshopped it a little bit. Um, and I think, uh, something along the lines of like local transitions or something like that just to like give a nod to you know local community small business and also um, the trans community but um, it's definitely still a work in progress we're not a hundred percent sold on that yet i totally put you on the spot but that's a <laughs> great <laughs> that's idea okay. Thank you. Um, well i'd love to hand it off to you and i'm really excited to to learn more about your talk today so we'll have questions at the end take right. it away vaughn Thank you so much. All right, so I am gonna share my screen. And it doesn't look like it's up yet. Maybe it's loading. There we go, awesome. All right, so today we are going to be talking about how to create and maintain healthy communities. Um, and you might see on this slide that I have a different title than what Andrew just said. Uh, so this uh, new title, I'm very excited, will be effective as of next week. Um, so I will be your new director of programs at the Triple Association. I'm really excited about that. Um, <clears throat> so you'll see uh, the QR code on the screen is a link to the Google Slides. Um, so that you have a copy of them if you would like to uh, revisit the slides at a later date. Um, and then there is also a URL for the slides, which I believe is in the chat here, but it's l.ead.me slash July hyphen A11Y in case you need it. Um, all right, so let us get started. So I always like to start a conversation. So first of all, this is an interactive session. Uh, so I really like to uh, engage audiences. I don't like to talk at you, I like to talk with you. Um, and even, even presentations like this are a micro community, right? So I like to establish some roles and Andrew already did a great job of that at the beginning, but I just wanna you know, talk through a couple of extra ones. So um, when we're talking about new topics or we're learning new things together, it's important to manage our personal discomfort and take risks so that we can learn. Um, and have respect and accountability for each other and for ourselves. So holding ourselves to um, a high standard of integrity is important. 
Um, progress and patience is the goal as well as self and community care. So if you're struggling with something, you're finding something really hard, take a break and come back um, and also check in with each other. Um, my role as a facilitator is to share resources and foundational knowledge, provide tangible strategies and best practices and support you in your learning. My role is not to shame you. My role is not to know everything. It's to um, uh, walk with you on the journey together. Um, so those are the roles I like to establish in a space uh, ahead of having a conversation. All right, so brief overview. What are we gonna talk about today? So we're gonna talk about what is a virtual community? Um, what does that really mean? We use that word a lot, but what does it mean? What are the key elements of psychological safety in those communities? What are the barriers and what strategies can we use to maintain healthy communities? Um, so that is what I'm hoping to uh, chat with you all about today. All right, so you'll see here, this is a different QR code. So the first QR code that you saw was for the Google Slides. This is to uh, play in these activities with me. So you can scan the QR code on the screen or you can go to menti, www.menti.com, which is spelled M-E-N-T-I. Dot com, um, and then you can enter the code seven one two two three six three, and I believe all this information is in the chat as well. So um, this is so that we can do activities together, and I'll be able to see your answers in real time. So uh, just so that you all are aware, when you do answer questions, they will show up on the screen. There, it doesn't show your name, but it will show your answer. So just so that you're aware, we're all doing informed consent and everything like that. I see some emojis coming in, which is great. All right. So just to kick us off, in one to two words, describe how you're feeling coming into this conversation about communities, about psychological safety. Um, and this can be your feelings about the topic, your knowledge, it can be um, your uh, positionality to the conversation. It can just be whatever vibe you're in right now. Uh, you know, maybe if you're in a time zone that's super early in the morning, maybe you're feeling really sleepy. Um, cool, supported, excited, listening. So um, what's cool is you can see excited is big because more than one person said that, which is pretty cool. It's the, the dominant feeling, which is awesome. All right, let me give a couple more minutes. Curious, listening, excited, safer, love that, open. These are great words. I love this. Awesome. So it seems like if I am reading this correctly, we're all kind of in a positive headspace coming into this conversation, which is great because um, learning is better facilitated when you're feeling good. So happy to hear that. Interested. Cool. All right. So jumping to the next question, um, you should see the slide change on your device, whatever device you're using to access Mentimeter. Um, what is a community to you? When you hear the word community, what do you think of when you think of community? I'm gonna mute myself while I take a sip of coffee so that I don't have gulping sounds in your recording. All right, I see one person came and said friends and family supporting each other, a shared opportunity to make a difference slash create reality with like-minded colleagues. I love that one. Group with something in common. Mm -hmm. People with shared values, people who come together, establish connections in likely or unlikely ways. That's a great one. Occupy a shared space. So I'm getting um, a sneaking feeling that maybe some of you studied sociology or public health or social work um, because some of these are straight out of the textbook, which is incredible. Um, these are all really great answers and pretty spot on actually. So what is a community? In sociology, in the discipline, there is no singular accepted definition of community. Um, many theorists have created working definitions. The one that I personally use is a group who follows a social structure within a society bound by a sense of belonging sustained across time and space, which is almost exactly what a lot of you said on the last slide, right? Shared values, um, you know, working towards a common goal. 
And today we're going to be looking at virtual communities specifically, but these principles can be extended into local communities as well. So um, one thing that I really, really try to hammer home every time I talk about community and psychological safety is that our virtual communities should reflect our communities in the meat space, right? Like we should be replicating the way that we would treat each other um, face to face online. Um, so that is the goal. So even though we're talking about virtual communities, we can apply these principles also there as well. So communities are also classified based on the purpose. And a lot of you talked about purpose on the activity slide of what community is to you. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not going to read these word for word, uh, but definitely feel free to, to check out these definitions after the presentation. But uh, there's five main things. So there's interest, action, place, practice, and circumstance. Um, and so you might end up in community for a variety of different reasons, but it's a community all the same, right? So virtual communities are all of these things, could be all of these things, except for place, right? So typically in a virtual community, you're not brought together by the coincidence of a common geographical habitation. However, you might be brought together by coincidence via a workplace. Maybe you work remotely, maybe you just got hired somewhere new um, and it's not geographical, but you wouldn't necessarily be in community with those folks unless you worked at that company. Um, so the, the key takeaway here is that a virtual community can exist for any of these reasons really, except for place, but we would just kind of pivot place to mean something different in this context. Um, and especially in virtual communities where we're working towards a common goal like open source, um, you know, that's interest, but it's also action. Um, and it's also practice, right? And it could also be circumstance. Maybe, you know, you are at a college seminar and there is a presentation on open source, then you end up doing a code sprint that afternoon. Like you didn't plan to do that, right? So that means that a multitude of different people can be in your community, right? For all of these different reasons. So in order for communities to function with longevity, with safety in a healthy way um, that doesn't cause long-term harm, we need to implement key elements of psychological safety in our communities. Um, and this can be a challenge, especially for communities that are that, that don't have governance of some kind, um, because you, we in our society broadly, um, in in the Western world, but also in, in other cultures and civilizations all over the world, we tend to look to our leaders to establish the, you know, rules, regulations, expectations, but what would it look like if our communities established psychological safety as collectives? Um, and I think that that is a more sustainable solution long term. Now, I do think you need checks and balances, right? You do still need people to, um, you know, have ownership of your psychological safety to some degree because people move on. People, you know, are in different places at different times all the time. Um, so I think it's important to have two things. One is a group of people who are committed to upholding these collective ideals that you've come up with together. And also each individual person in the community feeling responsible for that psychological safety. So it's a balance, right? So the key elements that I wanna talk about today are navigating power and oppression, individual and systemic. Um, so that basically means there are power dynamics in our society that are identity-based, they are um, you know, circumstantially based. So an example of individual power dynamic would be um, say you're in a Drupal working group of some kind um, in an open source working group that's totally volunteer and you and your boss are both in this working group. Um, this person is not your boss in the working group, but they're, in, they're your boss nine to five, Monday through Friday, right? So that power dynamic still exists even though you're not in the workplace. So that is an example of individual power dynamic. Um, and systemic is those identity-based ones, right? So uh, you might be equal to somebody, maybe you're on a, uh, a subcommittee with somebody um, and you are somebody who is like me and you're an LGBTQ plus person of color and this other person is a non-POC, non-LGBT person and they're really enacting a lot of harm in that space. It's really hard for you as the marginalized person to address that because that's a systemic power dynamic, right? 
So we have to we have to name those things openly, and we have to navigate them openly. Um, you know, we can't let uh, systemic level harm and violence kind of go on in silence. Um, which leads me to the next element, which is trust and vulnerability. So in order to navigate these power dynamics, we have to establish trust and vulnerability in communities. Um, there's a lot of conversation out there in the, the cultural zeitgeist around cancel culture and what it is. And there's a lot of debate about whether it exists at all. And I would tend to think that it doesn't. Um, the people that have canceled, been canceled, continue to go on to have pretty functioning careers most of the time, as long as they are not of marginalized identity, right? But in a community, um, the goal is to call each other in, not call each other out, right? So there's a great book and I have it linked in the slides that's uh, We Will Not Cancel Us. And it's about in communities, building trust and vulnerabilities so that we can hold each other accountable um, in ways that are affirming and that really lead to real change. Um, the next one is agency. So having every person involved in the community and making decisions and feeling empowered to own their own sense of psychological safety, community care, um, supporting, and, supporting and nurturing each other in that agency. So that means we have to work on our ego a little bit uh, and, and take ourselves out of those situations and say like, what do you need? How can I support you in this moment? Um, and transparency. So having everything publicly and readily available for your community members. So that doesn't mean that anyone and everyone can find your uh, you know, policies, your code of conduct or anything like that. That's not necessarily the case, right? Especially in like a closed group. So I uh, work with an organization called Philadelphia Asian and Queer. And most of our programs are closed for queer and trans uh, identified Asian and Asian American identified people. And we don't share any of our documentation publicly, but we do share it freely and openly with our community members. Um, and that is to build that psychological safety. Um, and then accountability. So you have to have systems in place when someone does do harm. Is there a clear and concise path that we can follow to restoring those relationships in an accountable way for everyone that everyone can learn and grow that's not carceral? So those are the key elements. <laughs> So um, I have a little question for you all. Uh, it's just a, a knowledge check. Um, true or false, individual and systemic power dynamics function independently from each other. What do you all think? Okay, I have one, one answer has come in so far. Two. All right, and I think we have, oh, nine, awesome, great. Cool. All right, so false. Individual and systemic power dynamics do not function independently from each other. And that's what makes them so hard, right? So uh, what, do, what does this sentence mean even? So it means that when in our individual relationships, our one-to-one -one connections with other people, those systemic power dynamics are always present, no matter what individual conversation we're having, um, because they are an, an ever-present reality of the world that we live in. Um, so uh, one example I might give about this is a uh, teacher who is gay could easily lose their job if a straight student were to accuse them of misconduct, even if it wasn't true. And we have seen that documented um, in, in, in history in the United States. Um, and so the individual power dynamic there, the teacher has power over the student surely, but the systemic power dynamic of a straight student with a gay teacher is ever present even in that individual relationship. So that that is kind of what I'm talking about here. So we have to be conscious of these power dynamics in our communities. Um, because even if you're not actively talking about homophobia, transphobia, racism, ableism, you know, any other form of oppression, even if that's not at the forefront of the conversation, those systems are always present and we have to be mindful of them in the way that we cultivate our communities. So thank you for doing that activity with me. 
So what are some barriers? Uh, these are the ones we just talked about. Uh, so systemic power dynamics, those of marginalized identity are held to different standards than those of privileged identity. And I have a great matrix for you to kind of see what I mean by marginalized versus privileged identity that I can share with you if you'd like. Um, and this is contextual uh, depending on where you live. So there is you know, established identities of marginality and privilege in the United States versus Europe versus you know, different parts of Asia, you know, and on and on. However, the systemic oppressive systems are globally universal. Even if we identify and label ourselves, label ourselves differently, those systems of oppression are global. Um, so the other barrier is there's a perceived lack of severity when harm is enacted in digital spaces. And this is what I was talking about at the top of the presentation is the goal is to have our virtual communities reflect our communities in the tangible physical world, right? But to be honest with you, you know, and this is evidence-based as well. This isn't just an opinion, right? like the studies, there's lots of studies about this that I can share with you as well, that we don't hold ourselves to the same standards online that we do in person. Um, and we often say things that we would never say online than we would in person to someone's face. So there's a perceived lack of severity, but um, anyone who's been on the receiving end of hate online, social media hate, or even like antagonistic DMs or anything like that, you know that the harm is the same, right? It feels the same and it, and it triggers the same pain receptors in our brain as it does someone saying something harmful to our faces. And this makes it really hard to practice radical accountability because if we don't acknowledge harm, how can we heal it? Um, and you know, it's a lot easier to stop talking to someone online. It's a lot easier to, you know, just can continue just to decide not to engage anymore. So that, um, transformative accountability is a lot harder to do virtually. Um, and then we live in a fear-based culture that does not reward vulnerability. Um, so creating healthy communities goes against everything we're socialized to do. So um, if you think back to the early 2000s, actually even the 80s and 90s too, all the self-help books of like how to get ahead in business, how to, you know, push your career forward. It's always uh, those kind of like old fashioned values of like, you know, you got to be tough, you got to be, be the best. And so it, we've all been conditioned and it, all, it actually starts in elementary school, right? Like you have to get the best grades, you have to, you know, have the highest reading level. Um, and particularly for those of marginalized identity, if you go to a teacher and say, hey, so-and-so pushed me off the swings, a lot of us probably heard, oh, just ignore them, right? So it discourages vulnerability. It discourages accountability. So creating these good, com healthy community systems goes against what we're socialized to do in, in the broader context of society. Um, and that's okay, right? Like we're all on learning together. And if we can acknowledge like, hey, this is really challenging because I've learned the opposite. We can all, you know, like walk each other there together to, to get to that place. But it starts with that acknowledgement first. So I want you to think about the communities that you're in, the communities that you navigate virtually um, whether it's a working group, whether it's just like a volunteer group, whether it's like a Discord server that you're in, it could be an employee resource group that you're in, um, and think about what are the barriers that you see to creating such psychological safeties in your communities? Um, what are some things that you notice? Um, and it could be things that I've already shared, or it could be things that I didn't share. Um, and I'll give folks a couple of minutes to pop their answers in here.
I really relate to this one. I grew up in rural North Carolina and I, I uh, definitely feel for you, uh, whoever wrote this, because it's, yeah, it's really challenging in rural communities. Yeah, absolutely. So if someone is in a more privileged position, they don't necessarily feel the same need to uphold and configure the space to support safety. Yeah, exactly. So if it doesn't affect me, why should I care, right? It's that like, well, it doesn't hurt me, so I'm not worried about it syndrome. Um, and again, that's something we're really conditioned against, right? We're, we're um, and it's not a bad thing to be concerned about your own needs first, right? Like putting your, your own oxygen mask on before others is definitely import, important. Um, but in a community, in a collective, we have to care about other people's needs. It's important. Um, acceptance, understanding, appreciation of difference. Yes, absolutely. So difference is like, oh my gosh, you're different. That's so scary. Um, and, and cultivating appreciation is really important. Historical precedence. This is a big one. So if you've joined a community that's been established for a long time, old patterns are really hard to break. And that's when we talk about change management. Um, so, you know, sometimes we have to see things cycle through a little bit before we can see those changes happen and start to build that safety because breaking those habits is really, really, really hard, especially if there there's like decades long precedent. It's really challenging for sure. Fear of repercussions, exactly. And that and that is why um, I go back to that agency and accountability piece. Because if we cultivate a collective that's rooted in trust and vulnerability and transparency, then we know that we won't face repercussions for speaking up. But if we haven't cultivated that space, then we are afraid. Yeah, community members not being included in decision making. Again, that's agency. That's ex extremely important. Like collective decision making is important, especially if it affects you. Um, funding is a big thing too, especially like for volunteer uh, communities. It's really, really hard to make effective change without resources. Extremely, extremely important point. Um, and then these last two are similar. So making folks aware that privilege exists and then denial of privilege, lack of recognition. Yes. And I think this is one of the largest barriers, especially around um, individual and systemic oppression, right? So if someone, and I think, you know, we have seen this play out um, culturally in, in the more public facing space in the last couple of years. But I think those of us who've been navigating this work for a long time know that this is not new, but privilege is not to say that one's life is not difficult, right? Like that's not what privilege means. It is talking about things in your life being difficult are not related to systemic oppression. And I think that receiving that message can be really hard for people. Um, and you know, there's definitely ways to to make it easier, but I think you really need to utilize, you know, going back to the funding conversation, those resources to to establish that because in those individual conversations, maybe sometimes you won't be heard. And maybe it's about finding the individual that will um, be able to communicate that message in a way that they will be heard. So thank you so much for sharing your experiences with me. I really appreciate that. All right. So what strategies can we use to maintain healthy communities? So be demonstrative, demonstrative, you have to live it. So model the barriers you hope to see in others. And um, this is a lot easier if you're living it, right? So um, even in the face of conflict or difficult conversation, or even like, you know, active harm and oppression, if you're living it and you're modeling it, um, people do see you doing that. And it is not always easy but modeling that behavior encourages everyone to continue that collective accountability with each other. So explain why you're choosing to navigate a situation the way that you are. So giving the why is really helpful for people. It helps them feel like they're being included in the decision-making. you know, that's that transparency piece as well. Um, and then be specific about how you would like to be interacted with. So um, having boundaries is essential to psychological safety. Um, psychological safety is not being open to anything and everything. Like people can come and talk to you however they want to talk to you. That's not what it is. It is 
creating reciprocal relationships where you understand one another. And sometimes psychological safety is, I really don't appreciate the way you're speaking to me right now. Let's revisit this at another time. That is psychological safety, but you know, cultivating an environment where you can set those boundaries is important. So on the flip side of that, of being demonstrative, be teachable and accountable. So no one is the keeper of all knowledge. Um, and uh, I've said this in a, in a previous uh, workshop with uh, I think some of the folks here, but I, anyone who calls himself like a diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, or justice expert, I would be wary of because it, you can't be an expert on everything, right? On everything related to DEI, accessibility and justice. Um, one singular person cannot be the keeper of all, of all things. Um, so it's a practice. It's something that we practice and that we're always learning. So we're all capable of harm and we're all capable of healing. Um, so center restoration and understanding in your accountability process and not carcerality. Um, and if you're not familiar with carcerality, it is the idea of punitive action or punishment when someone does something wrong. So if someone makes mistakes or says something hurtful in the heat of the moment, your accountability process being um, restorative will say, hey, here's what you did. Here's the harm that it caused. Here's how the person you affected would like for this to be addressed. Can we move forward together? Rather than, well, now you can't come to meetings for the next six months. It's kind of that same logic with toddlers. Like if you put them in timeout, they don't necessarily learn anything. Um, a lot of child development can be applied to adult de development. Um, and because uh, we're all like at every stage of development, we're still human. So next, prevent and address artificial harmony. So you might feel like, oh, well, everyone gets along here. We never have hard conversations. We all work really well together. You might be experiencing some artificial harmony. So healthy communities don't agree all the time um, and they don't strive for perfection, right? So a healthy community, you're gonna have hard conversations. You're gonna get into disagreements. You're gonna approach things differently. So if you're not having any kind of conflict at all and there's no conflict resolution happening, it's probably not a, not a psychologically safe environment um, because marginalized community members who see harm going on and don't say anything means that they don't feel safe to say something. Um, one to two leaders dominating a conversation and lack of good faith dissent. So good faith dissent is important in community. Um, in a community, it's important to be able to engage in hard conversations knowing that you both have intentions of improving the space and that you both have care for the community at, at, at the center of your conversation. So if you have people dissenting and it's not coming from a place of good faith, it's probably not a psychologically safe environment. Um, and then the last one, which I think is the most important is create a brave space, not a safe space. So, you know, I think that the the term no safe spaces has been co-opted in recent years to mean something that it doesn't mean. Um, and then it act like the way that people are using the phrase no safe spaces is to say that you can treat people however you want. Um, and that's not really what the original purpose of that phrase was. So when we say there's no safe spaces, we mean that we are not in control of and do not own other people. Right, So we're only in control of our own behaviors, our own values. I cannot prevent another person from doing harm. I'm just not in control of other human beings, right? That's not, that's just not how people work, right? So creating a brave space means that you understand that people will do something harmful. They will make mistakes. They will misstep and we will be there to help them and support them and support the people that they harmed. So that's the difference between a brave space and a safe space. We can't guarantee that people won't hurt each other because like I said on the left side, we're all capable of harm, but we're all capable of healing. So having restorative codes of con conduct like um, Ally Talks does, uh, shared the accessibility code of conduct at the top of the hour, which is great. Um, Drupal has a code of conduct, but having a, a publicly accessible and restorative code of conduct is really important in creating a brave space. So knowing that you know, people can go to it and say, okay, if I make a mistake or if I hurt somebody, here's exactly what's going to happen and it's all going to be fine, right? Um, checks and balances, so community accountability. So you don't want one person owning the code of conduct, right? Maybe it's a committee, maybe it's a, you know, you all do it together, maybe it's collective. Um, but 
you don't ever want to aggregate power into a single entity. Um, and then continuously build on foundations of trust so that we can assume good intentions of each other. Assuming good intentions doesn't work in environments where we are not acknowledging systemic oppression, right? So, um, you know, as a person who is, um, you know, like biracial, my, my ancestors are from the Philippines, I cannot assume good intentions of somebody saying something offensive about Filipino people at the grocery store, right? I'm not gonna assume good intentions of that person necessarily. However, in a community group like Philly, Philly Asian and Queer, in a community conversation, if someone who is Korean says something offensive about Filipino people in a closed environment communication like that, I can assume good intentions of that person and know that they just didn't know. And I know that I can take that opportunity to educate them and we can you know, build a bridge together and move forward. So that's the difference. Um, it's contextual. So when I say assume good intentions of each other, I don't mean that people of privileged identity can walk around and say harmful things and marginalized people shouldn't assume good intentions of them. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in these brave spaces that you've cultivated. Um, and that distinction is really important because this idea of good intentions is often weaponized um, and then it's not serving the purpose that it needs to serve in psychological safety, right? All right. So. What strategies do you currently use in your online communities to build psychological safety? It can be in the four components that I shared or it can be one that I didn't share. Um, and I encourage you to be specific if you can so that your peers and people watching the recording can learn from you. And then I can learn from you because like I said, we don't all know everything. I don't know everything. Um, and I think that this is a really cool opportunity for us to do that, that collective decision-making together. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple minutes to tell me the strategies that you use in your online communities. And then I can also, okay, cool. I was gonna say, I can repost the um, link chat if you need it. Breaks from social media. I love that answer. So I don't, even though I work in technology, um, I don't have public social media other than my work Twitter, which I don't tweet on. <laughs> So um, I think that is a, a great strategy to use um, because our real connections that are psychologically safe connections very rarely happen on social media, sometimes, but very rarely. So I think that is a great example. And then um, I love to hear that your job has a code of conduct. That's awesome. That's a couple more minutes. And again, I'm going to mute to drink my coffee. All right, so um, if you have other strategies you want to share, um, I'm sure that we can uh, circle the wagons and find them another place. But thank you so much to the person who did share. I think that's a great example. Um, other strategies you might use is um, having a bank of some sort with all of the resources that you might need. So like a, just like a drop place that has sort of conduct, like definitions that you use in your community um you know point people that kind of thing um, it might be kind of another good strategies too all right so uh 
I want to take a little bit of time. I know that we're going to answer some questions as well from the Twitter, but I wanted to give an opportunity for you all to ask any questions um, as part of this presentation on anything that we have covered so far before we get to the Twitter questions that maybe have come up as you are thinking. Um, so if you are in the, the menti.com with this code, you should have a screen um, in front of you on your device that says, ask a question. And I have access to the moderation pane. So I would love to hear your questions about psychological safety and hear from you uh, about what you're curious about, um, even if it's not something that we specifically talked about so far. Great conversation, Vaughn. I'm looking forward to some uh, questions coming in. Um, I was, uh, on your last comment, uh, I was typing something, but just wasn't fast enough. Um, you know, something that we strive- Sorry about that. Ellie, no, no worries. Um, I, I was trying to formulate the question in a way, uh, not really a question, but a comment um, for, online spaces that I'm in, uh, I work really hard to anticipate the needs of the audience. And then once um, somebody points something out, uh, try and learn from the past from that event and apply it forward. Um, we're all human, we do our best. Um, it's, you know, one of the things that we do here, uh, the Thyssen link, which is a AI captions and transcripts as we do that. So that's a service we use at Alley Talks during the talks. Um, so we have it set up uh, and then uh, attempted to post that through it. So well, as I say this, we have our space. Um, we try and have these accommodations um, and learn from it. But we're human. We posted it a little late. So sorry, people uh, joining. But it's there now. And uh, we have a good transcript uh, for it. So that's something that um, we try and apply that moving forward. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate you, Andrew, like practicing accountability during this conversation. That is that modeling behavior, and that's incredible, and I really appreciate that because it's hard to stand up and say, hey, we made a mistake, sorry. Like that is, it's so important to be able to do that, um, and I think it encourages others to be able to do that as well. Um, so I got a great question come through. So talk a little bit more about the artificial harmony that you mentioned, saying, yes, we all get along, but they but they actually quell dissent. So artificial harmony is really dangerous because you think that you're doing a great job, right? And you think that everyone feels comfortable here. Um, and a good way to recognize whether or not artificial harmony is happening is look who in the room is talking. And this is going to cause some discomfort. Um, and, but I always say every time I teach a workshop that graceful discomfort is where the magic happens. It's where the growth happens. So get okay with being uncomfortable. But if you are in a community and the only people that are talking, well, first of all, you're in a community, everyone gets along. Nobody fights, nobody argues, you all move forward, you all collaborate, it looks great. But the only people that talk are cisgender, are able-bodied, are white, are men, you have artificial harmony. And that is in a community that is um, like an intersectional community, right? So that's like, for example, in Drupal, like we have everyone from all identities. So if you're in a working group that has multiple identities and only the dominant identities are talking and nobody fights, that's artificial harmony. Now, if you're in a more subsect community for like, for example, for myself, I'm in Philadelphia Asian and Queer, like I mentioned. In Philadelphia Asian and Queer in a planning committee meeting, if none of us are getting into arguments and the only people that are talking are cisgender, are, um, you know, maybe like East Asian identified, so none of our South Asian or Southeast Asian or biracial Black and Asian members are talking, um, that's something to pay attention to. Um, and this can be attributed to any community that you're, maybe you're in a women's group and you're looking around and there are no trans women, there are no disabled women, there are no black women in that group. That's artificial harmony. So you have to create an environment where people can tell you that you've done something wrong, 
and that you can tell people that they've done something wrong and you can engage in a conversation about it and you can restore and repair that relationship because without that that you're not you're not really creating psychological safety you're only creating psychological safety for the dominant group and that is not what we want right so that was a great question thank you do you have another question through your um, slides? Because we have a few um, from our side on. So are you ready? I for don't. It? Yeah, let's go for it. All right, great. So um, I'll go ahead and read it off. Uh, how do you open a difficult conversation with someone you respect, especially when you're non-confrontational? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so I think that relationality is extremely important in communities. So if it's someone that you respect a lot, um, I would start by asking yourself if that person respects you. Um, so, you know, I think that mutual respect is, is an essential element of psychological safety, whether it's with a manager, a direct report, or a community member, or anyone that you're, you know, in community with. Um, and if you, if the, if the answer, when you ask yourself, I really respect this person, I wonder if they respect me, if the answer is no, that is going to make that difficult conversation really hard. So I would, I would, that this is that support and nurture and peace. So I would find someone that you know that this person does respect to um, act as a sounding board, you know, go to them and be like, you know, we're in community together. Here's this thing that's happening. I want to do a radical accountability process. I'm feeling um, challenged by that. Um, my communication style is non-confrontational. Like, what would you suggest? And then, you know, having an ally enter that conversation with you is really helpful. If you do have mutual respect with that person, I would approach it um, with your authenticity, right? So I think being honest about your needs goes a really long way. Like, Hi, my friend, you know that it's really hard for me to have hard conversations. I really, um, you know, I'm not usually a confrontational person. I want you to know that I'm not coming to you with this um, to be confrontational, but because I see something that needs to be repaired between us, can we have a conversation? Um, because difficult conversations don't have to be confrontational, right? And neither does conflict. Uh, you know, we can have hard conversations with people that we love and respect and know that the goal is to reach that true harmony and, and restoration. Um, so I think the biggest piece of advice around this that I can give though is to be your authentic self in these conversations. So um, for me personally, I am a direct person, but I'm not a blunt or harsh person. So I am always gonna come out at a place of I know that you're doing this because of this reason. I really respect you. I understand why you're doing it. Here's why I think it's harmful. Can we talk about it? Rather than like, hey, what you're doing is not good, you know? So whatever your communication style is, um, be true to that and also really get to know other people's communication style. It's really helpful too. So how do they respond? Um, how did they need to receive information? Um, that's, a, that's a good thing that you can do as well. And you can kind of do that by listening, you can take quizzes together. I love quizzes, I think quizzes are really fun. Um, I think Enneagrams are really fun. Uh, Discovery Insights is a really fun thing to do too in community. Um, and so figuring out that person's communication style so that they could hear you. Um, so those would be the, the three main things. So to summarize, find a support person, be authentic to the way that you communicate and understand the way that they need to, to be communicated with to receive your message. That's great. Thank you. That's wonderful advice. Uh, we can move on to the uh, next question. How do we support folks who are experiencing alley fatigue when many groups feel insulted because they do not have the privilege of being about to take a break? Yes, this is a great question. Um, and I kind of see a couple of ways to navigate this. So ally fatigue is a is a, a big problem in communities. And I think um, I, I talked a little bit about this in the out and open source panel that I did with uh, the uh, DD and I and WordPress diversity inclusion, which is that um, I truly, for my values, I truly believe that you the collective you, the universal you, are capable of learning and growing beyond what you believe. And so 
I personally find it to be insulting to other people's intelligence to say, well, they just didn't know. Because the, especially in virtual communities, online virtual communities, there is a plethora of access and information out there. And it is at all of our fingertips at any moment, you know? And I think that uh, we all know how to like source good information. You know, we know what a good source looks like versus not a good source looks like. So I would say as as kindly and gracefully as you can in a community, um, challenge and encourage people who are having ally fatigue to reach for those expectations that you know that they can reach, that we can all reach, right? Um, I understand where you're coming from. Think about this. Think about the historical context of this. I know that you know that that information is out there and I know that you can can rise to the challenge because I believe in your ability to do that. Um, and that's really how I navigate those conversations. Like I truly believe that every person, when if they're given the opportunity and the push will rise to the occasion and maybe no one has given them the push and maybe it's you and maybe it's not. Um, you know, I really resonate with being a marginalized person that doesn't get to have ally fatigue because my rights are on the line every moment that I wake up in the morning. Um, and I do this work professionally, right? So I'm always going to be that person to challenge you. And, and you know, I'm always going to be the person to ask people to rise to the occasion because that's the life path that I have chosen. If that's not your life path, you don't have to do that. You know, it is not your responsibility as a marginalized person to, you know, tell someone of a dominant identity, like, hey, I don't get to have ally fatigue. Like, you don't have to be the, the poster child of marginalized suffering. Um, so I would say supporting folks is finding people who maybe they share an identity with that understand the logical fallacy of ally fatigue in privileged identities that you can champion, right? That's that support and nurturance piece again. Like, if you know you have like a really awesome ally that really does the work that can hold other allies accountable, definitely lean on that person for sure. Um, and then I think also just showing up in spaces as uh, the version of you that you feel comfortable sharing in those spaces. So uh, we talked about this at DrupalCon and one of the keynotes, like we're not all going to be our authentic selves all the time, especially if we're marginalized because it's not safe for us to do that. But if you're in a community that you have built that safety within, living in your truth often opens people's eyes, but only if you have cultivated that sense of trust. Great advice. Uh, let's go to the, the next question. Um, as a woman dev, I deal with mansplaining and disrespect from some in my job. How can I deal with this? Yes. So this is like a tale as old as time, right? And it's it's this is, again, one of those things where I know the men at your job know better. I know that they have access to the information. I know that they know what mansplaining is. And I know that they know that their behavior is harmful. So um, in a, so this doesn't necessarily sound like a community environment if it's at work. Some workplaces are communities, but not all of them are. It's like squares and rectangles, right? Um, not every job functions like a community. So um, these principles of psychological safety might not apply in this environment that you're in at work. Um, you know, if, you're, if your leadership team at your job has not cultivated a community of, or a psychologically safe workplace, you're not gonna be able to use these tools, right? Um, because it's a different environment. So I would say, I would find a workplace ally. Again, I really think allyship goes a long way, a support person who can really speak on your behalf. Maybe it's your manager, maybe it's a colleague, you know, find someone who is gonna speak up for you. Um, in workplaces, especially, we really suffer from bystander effect. So we have, um, uh, oh my gosh, I can't remember the, the, the term right now, but there is a phenomenon at workplaces where someone will witness harm happen in a meeting and then they'll wait till a meeting's over and then they'll come up to you and be like, that was really messed up. Well, how does that disrupt anything if you're waited until it's over to say something to me, right? So find someone who's gonna speak up for you. Um, maybe it's HR, maybe, um, and, and, and again, I think I go back to your authentic communication style. So if you feel comfortable going up to people and being like, hey, 
I know what I'm doing. You're enacting this type of behavior. I really don't appreciate that. Can we find some common ground? Um, go that route. But if you're not comfortable doing that or you don't, or you are in a power dynamic situation where you can't do that. So if the people mansplaining you are in positions of power over you, um, that's when you have to start kind of bringing in those other systems. Um, and the other thing too, and this, this does feel kind of yucky, but I have found that it is unfortunately necessary sometimes in extremely toxic workplaces is keep that paper trail, you know, document it every time it happens so that you have it. Um, and, and this is where we're getting into an arena of what the goal is versus what currently is. So cultivating a psychologically safe community is the goal, but if you're currently in a toxic workplace, you have to navigate that in its reality versus what you would like for it to be. Um, so more traditional systems might make sense, but I really think having an ally who those folks who are mansplaining you identify with, speak up, makes a tremendous difference. Um, I definitely experienced that as well and had a, an ally really, really turn the tides on that for me. So, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, we'll have one more question and then uh, we'll go on and wrap up. Time went by cool. really fast. So yeah. <laughs> it always does, right? How can yeah. we make those who are disabled more welcome in all of our communities, including remote ones like this? Yeah. So I am going to start prefacing this conversation by going back to my point about not everyone is a DEI expert. So I think I find that it is extremely important not to speak for communities that you're not a part of. And so I am a temporarily able-bodied person. Um, and so I am not speaking from a place of what I think is best for disabled people as a disabled person. That's not where I'm coming from. I'm coming from a systems perspective and also um, I am correctable and teachable as well. So I'll start by saying that. What I'll, what I'll say though is that a uh, disability like any other marginalized identity has to be named. We, um, and I think it, in my experience as a DEI practitioner, disability is something that we tiptoe around in ways that we don't tiptoe around some other identities. Um, and we also infantilize disability in a way that we don't infantilize other identities. Um, and so I think um, acknowledging disability in our spaces starts like that is you know maybe it sounds self-explanatory but that's that's phase one right uh and acknowledging that disability is intersectional so um you aren't always going to know if someone is disabled so um i think go going to something that you actually said andrew is anticipating people's needs so rather than waiting to see oh do we have someone who's hard of hearing do we have someone with mobility um, needs? Do we have someone um, who is neurodivergent? Assume that you do and just have those systems in place to begin with. Um, don't don't wait for, for um, disabled people to tell you what they need. Um, anticipate needs and have those things in place already built into your communities because we will all be disabled one day. You know, this is not, that's, it's not like this niche identity that only some people experience. Like, you know, all of us will at some point in our lives. Um, and so if you build those good systems in on, the, on like just as part of your community to begin with, I think it reduces a lot of harm. And then again, being open to being told what people need that you didn't think of. And remembering that this person is not coming to you and telling you that they need something that you didn't do because you're a failure. They're coming to you because they trust you to implement it. And anytime someone tells you what they need that you're not already doing is a gift because they're telling you so that you can do something about it. I, um, I, I find that if I need something and I don't tell somebody, it's because I don't believe that you're capable of making it happen for me. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree more. Uh, something you said in there is I am correctable and teachable. Uh, I feel like I should have that t-shirt and wear it <laughs> often. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because, um, being open, uh, anticipating um, is and, and learning from it, and then applying it. So not just learn, uh, being in that experience and say, "Wow, I learned something." Let's apply that, and that's the new standard moving forward for it. So the gift of 
being corrected is is a wonderful approach to anything so yeah um, absolutely and i mean also i feel like it's important to to demonstrate so if you've been corrected and taught and then you don't make those changes you are communicating a lack of safety so you have to you have to you have to live it for sure well, thank you so, so much. Um, do you have a few slides to go through at the end or some? I do, yeah. So just a, just a very quick wrap up for us. Um, so uh, I was going to do this. If you could maybe really quickly give me one to two words to describe how you're leaving this presentation today, really quickly. Um, Yay, Braver, love that answer. Inspired, enlightened, love that. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, so if you have a copy of the Google Slides, all of these links are clickable. Um, so these are citations that I use as well as for the readings on how to build psychological safety and community dynamics. I really, really encourage you to check them out. Um, bookmark it, add it to your summer reading list, whatever you need, um, really makes a difference. And um, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. This is where you can find me. Um, and then when I am not at Drupal, I also do this for professionally through consulting. So if you ever want to book a workshop with me, you absolutely can. And this is where you can find me, my website, phone number, and my other email. Um, but anything related to Drupal or open source, you can find me at any of these links. So thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. As a Drupalist, I appreciate you. I uh, really love this talk, Vaughn. That's great. Um, any links from today, as uh, was mentioned in the slides, um, we'll also uh, try and share them out on our Twitter account for Alley Talks. Uh, remember, remember to join us next month. We do this every month. We have some great speakers. Uh, we have some really exciting speakers lined up for the rest of the year. So check out our website for that. Um, new speakers, uh, hopefully today you were inspired or have an idea. Um, we're always looking for speakers and especially new voices in the accessibility community. Uh, we make a conscious effort to include marginalized groups in tech and in our speaker lineup. Please let us know if you have ideas on how to make Alley Talks more friendly to all. Uh, as a quick reminder for those with IAAP certifications, Alley Talks speakers and attendees get professional development credits which are C-A-E-C, through your I-A-A-P uh, for your continuing education. So we hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe to our YouTube. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. And also uh, consider contributing to Alley Talks through our Open Collective page. This is something that we've started uh, and something you'll see more in the coming weeks and months. So um, thank you so much. And until next time. Thank you.